Here at New Life, we believe that um, the word of the Lord is the loudest way he speaks. And so if y'all could stand up while I read. This is Acts 19, 1 through 20. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe, and he pu and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around, drive, went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that when they ran out of the house naked that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls, scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Would you bow with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we just want your will done this morning. We pray that your word would go forth and do what it's called to do, Lord. Father, we pray for every heart and every soul in here that they would hear your voice and that they would be led by your spirit, Lord. Father, we just want to glorify your name for you. Tell us if you are lifted up, you would draw all men unto you. Draw us unto you this morning, Lord. Let us move in your direction. Let us feel the peace and joy that only you can give us, Lord. Father, I just pray that you would be glorified because it's about you. It's always been about you. Father, thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for the way that you're changing our lives. Thank you for the things that you've done that we don't even acknowledge at times, yet you do them anyways. Please have your way this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. It's good to be back here. For some of you who may not know me, I am Pastor Robert. Um, love this church. I love when Bronson invites me down. Um, usually, we try to get rid of him and then come in, but he's here today. But it's always a joy to get the privilege and the right to talk about God's good news. And his news is always good. And so I pray this morning that you would just listen to his voice, hear his words, and be challenged and move in a direction that he wants to lead you. Um, we're going to talk about the heart, the heart of evangelism and how important that is and what it is. And, and, we, and we come to Paul here in this, in this situation where he is hidden into a city called Ephesus. And there he is going, preach the word. I, I can remember <laughs> times in my life where I was asked to come and, and, and preach the word. There was this one time where I was invited down to War Memorial. This was this big event that was going on, and they were going to have students and people and, and families all over the place. And so I went into deep prayer, praying, 
fasting, <laughs> whatever yeah, I needed to do. I was going to get myself ready. I was going to bring God's word, and I was going to deliver it, and lives were going to be changed, and people were going to receive Christ, and everybody said, ah! Well, I got there, and it was my turn to come up and come to speak, and you know, I'm prepared. I got my sword with me. I got all my studies in, ready to go. And so they announce my name, and I come up, and I start speaking, and people begin to get up and leave. And I'm speaking more, and I see a group of people over here, so I kind of turn over here and begin to speak about God's good news. They end up getting up and leaving. And so I look over here to the other corner, and my family is the only people that are left. <laughs> that are left right here. And so I talk to them for a minute, and then I pray, and then I say, let's get out of here. It was probably one of those moments that I really don't like reliving, but I think God has a sense of humor. Um, me being, oh, I'm so holy, I'm going to tell these people about Jesus. No, you're not. <laughs> there ain't going to be a soul there listening to you. I can only imagine how Paul felt at times. When he would go into cities and, and not knowing what he might face, not knowing if he was going to be laughed at, beat, put in prison, maybe even killed. But always his desire was to go and share the gospel with those who needed to hear. There was never any fear. There was never any doubt in his life when he began to preach God's word. The thing about him, if you remember in chapter 9, Early when he had his hands, <clears throat> excuse me, when Anna, Ananias put his hands on him and he, he became alive and his spirit was real and Jesus was real to him. And from that day forward, God told him, from here on out, you're going to be on a mission field for me. And you are going to go and you're going to preach God's word. Not only are you going to preach God's word, there are going to be people that are going to hate you. There are going to be people that are going to rebel against you. There are going to be people that want to kill you. But you're going to do it for my sake. And nothing from that moment on, from that encounter with the holy God, nothing ever deterred him from speaking God's word. So now he shows up in Ephesus. And here in Ephesus, Ephesus is mentioned a lot in Scripture. Here in Ephesus, he finds himself going back to a place where he was once there, but had decided to leave, but always promised that he would come back. He had no idea that when he would come back this time, some of the things that he would face. He had Jewish religious people that were there who did not recognize Jesus as the Messiah. They didn't talk about Jesus. They didn't talk about him as being this great holy man who came to save us. All they talked about is that he was a great prophet and a great man. He had people who were doing magic all around him, people who were, who were praying to, to pagans and pagan worshiping that was going on. So he had all of these challenges that were before him, and yet he was going anyways. So he enters into the city, and it tells us there in verse 1 through 3 and 4 right there that he runs into a group of men. Now, this is the thing. When your mind and when your heart is on Jesus and all that there is in your life and in your heart is to please Jesus, you are looking for opportunities to share Jesus. And that's what Paul was doing. Everywhere he went, he wanted people to know about the good news of Jesus. He wanted people to know how they can be saved, how they could be rescued from the life that they were living. And it didn't matter who it was he was sharing so he finds these 12 disciples who were disciples of John the Baptist, and they're just kind of sitting around not knowing what to do because they had not yet been exposed to the Holy Spirit. And Paul comes up to them and says, hey, what's going on, guys? Hey, Holy Spirit, you hear about it? Nope, don't know anything about it. I think sometimes we sit around and we wonder, when is it going to be our turn? Well, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit already dwells in you. And every one of us are commanded to share the gospel. When is it your turn? Right now. Your turn is right now. So Paul goes and he tells them, hey, let me give you a taste of the real thing. And he begins to pray over them. And he begins to teach them about the Holy Spirit. And they come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and his power. And they become his disciples. 
But that was not even his main reason of being in Ephesus, right? His job was to go where? Into the synagogues. And why would he go there? What was there? Well, it was his very people that were there. There were Jewish people there who still did not believe that Jesus had come and died on the cross for them. So he goes in and he begins to talk about the good news of Jesus Christ. So let's look there in verse 8. If you look there with me, he starts out this way. I don't know about you, but when I go into somebody's home or in somebody's establishment, I don't take over. I just kind of go over and kind of sit down and try to stay out of the way, right? Not Paul. Paul had a mission. He had a goal, and nothing was going to interfere with that. Look at what he does here. Verse 8, he says this, Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly. Now, what's the deal about the synagogue? This is what synagogues, how important they were to the Jewish people. It was a building where a Jewish assembly and the congregation would meet for religious worship and instructions. Not only that, the synagogues was the center of the Jewish religious community. It was a place of prayer. It was a place to study and to be educated. It was a place to be social and to be charitable. It was a place where everything went on. And Paul says, because I am Jewish and because I am a Pharisee, he had the credentials to where he could walk into any synagogue at any time and begin to preach. The only problem now is that he's preaching Christ. Now, this is how it is with our buddies, right? As long as we're buck wild with them, right? As long as we're engaging in everything they're engaging in, right? We're partners. Yeah, let's go do it. But as soon as you say, I'm born again, as soon as you say, Jesus lives in my life, as soon as you say, Jesus is Lord of my life, the relationship severs. Can you imagine Paul, who was the one who was out destroying Christians, wanted to get rid of this name Jesus, and he walks in there, and he starts preaching. Let's see what he does here. Paul entered into the synagogues and spoke boldly there for three months, argued persuasively about the kingdom of God. In other words, Paul walks in, he says, do you know Jesus? Because if you don't, I'm going to tell you about him. I am not going to be afraid. I'm not going to be intimidated. I am going to speak the name of Jesus Christ. And it says that he was bold when he walked through there. I don't think he went in there, hey, I'm here, and I just want to share a little something. And once I'm finished, I'll just get out of the way. I believe there was a big thing. Hey, I am here to preach the good news. Are you ready to hear it? I really believe that there was so much passion and so much love for the Lord that he didn't care where he was, what he was doing, who he was going to be talking to. He was going to preach God's word. I wonder what would happen, men and women, if we got to that point in our lives that it didn't matter who we encountered, whether it's our kids, whether it's our friends, whether it's our co-workers, and we just said, Jesus is Lord of Lords, and he can save your life. He can transform your life if you allow him to. What would happen to our city if we all got on fire for something that really mattered? Because that's where Paul was. When Paul walked into the synagogue because he was familiar with the religion, he was familiar with the people, he knew what they stood for, he went in there and he preached the good news. He wasn't bashful, nor was he ashamed. He was not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think at times we find ourselves in predicaments to where we really don't want to talk Christ. We really don't want him in our conversations. And it's not so much that we're embarrassed about him. It's just at times we just feel like it's an inconvenient thing to do. And plus, we don't want to offend anyone. How many of you who know the Lord Jesus Christ are tired of being tolerant towards everything else, but no one's tolerant towards Christ? I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. We can promote and talk about anything else. But when we start talking about Jesus, slow your roll. Not here. Not now. And we back up and we hush up. 
and we don't speak up like we ought to. But not Paul. Paul, it says, he went in and he was persuasive in what he talked about. And how could he be persuasive and how could he be bold? Because he had spent time with the Father. At times, we don't spend enough time with the Father getting prepared, reading his word, meditating on his word, letting that word devour us and letting that word consume us to where it's enriched in us. So when we're in conversation or when we're in certain situations, it just flows out of us because we spend so much time with the Heavenly Father. That's where Paul was. He had no fear when he walked into the synagogue. He bowed to no man except Jesus Christ. And he did not care what the outcome was going to be because he was going to preach the word and he was always, always obedient to his father. What would happen if we got excited and fired up about something that matters, something that will not fade away, something that is going to affect eternity long after we're gone? What would our society look like? What would our homes look look like? What would our marriages look like? What would our friendships look like? If Jesus Christ really was on the throne and really ruled our lives, what would it look like? I don't want to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want it to be said out loud. I want people to know that we stand for something else we'll be falling for everything else around us. We about to make a stand because there is a lost world outside these doors that are looking for some real people who are convicted by sin and are convicted by the spirit that lives inside of them. And each and every day they are striving after God's righteousness. They're longing to see that out here. It's one thing to come in on Wednesdays and on Sundays and whenever to hear God's word, but it's another thing of taking what you've heard outside these doors. And not only talking about it, but living it out. Paul was bold because he was living it out every day. He was praying every day. Every moment of his life, it was about Jesus Christ. It wasn't about him. It wasn't about his greatness. It wasn't about all of what he knew. It was about who he knew. And he wanted everyone else to know him. He walks into the synagogues and he is bold about what he preaches. Secondly, just because someone rejects the truth doesn't mean that it's not our job to share the gospel. Just because someone rejects us or what we have to say is no reason to stop sharing the gospel. Paul knows this very well because he has been kicked out of many places, right? He's been in prison. He's been beaten. He's been laughed at. So he knows this world. But he's preaching anyways, right? Look at what he does here. So Paul, excuse me, before that, verse 9. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe. They refused to believe. They refused to believe. And Paul left them. Have you ever had that friend or that family member to where you're constantly just trying to tell them this is what it is and they can't see it, they can't receive it, they reject it? Here, Paul is probably in here. It says that he's been there three months, right? Three months. How many of you get to spend three days with family and then say, that's it, y'all got to go? <laughs> that's the rule, right? Is it three days? Come on, let's be honest in here. Is it three days? You're tired of your in-laws? You're two? <laughs> Callie, did you see that? Two days with your parents. He wants out. <laughs> you get to thinking about that. How long did you want to deal with other folks at your home? Three, whatever it is. It says he was there three months preaching, talking, sharing. And finally, the hearts were so hard, not all of them, but many of their hearts were so hard, they just said, we don't want it anymore. And so what did Paul do? He says that he was done with them. He was done with them. 
In chapter 13, in Acts chapter 13, I believe it is 50, verse 51, there was another place where they were and they were sharing the gospel and all of a sudden the people didn't want it and it says they dust off their feet and got on out. There are moments where we might have to dust off our feet because their hearts and their ears are too hard, too cold, too stuffed up to hear truth. But it doesn't mean that we have to stop sharing the gospel just because we've been rejected by certain people. And I think it becomes so easy to get locked into, oh, I'm afraid of what they're going to say. I don't know how to say that. You got to remember that when they reject Christ, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting his grace and his love and his sweet spirit to enter into their hearts. We forget that it talks about Apollos, what he plants, somebody comes along and waters, right? And then it's God who brings it up to fruition. It's his job. And I think we get so caught up in our own little feelings and our own little emotions. I can't share because they're going to hate me after I share. Well, then that means all of that is about you. See, it's supposed to be about Christ. And I think we get so lost in it that we feel the weight of that, that we're going to lose friendships, that we're going to lose our relationship with our friends, with our neighbors, with our loved ones, if we share this truth with them. The truth is you're going to lose them anyways. You see, because if they don't come to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, you're going to lose them anyways. So what's hindering you from sharing the good news with those who are in desperate need of something better? I know at times we feel like we don't know enough, right? One of the reasons why we don't want to share, we don't want to be rejected, but sometimes we just don't know enough. Sometimes we don't know the culture. We don't know what they've been through. Sometimes we feel like we're infringing on their rights. I don't know what our reasons are, but the truth of the matter is that if we don't want to see our loved ones, our friends leave this place without knowing Christ, then we better take on the burden of telling them about Christ. Because when Jesus comes, two things, right? Depart from me, I never knew you. Enter in. That's it. That's it. And I know that might sound harsh, but that's what his word says. And Paul understood that. That these people who were saying, I don't want Christ to get out of here, I reject it. He was understanding that they were condemning their lives for eternity. And although it bothered him, I'm sure it did. He also knew that there was others that he needed to share with. You see, when we get lost in one or two people, and because their hearts are so hard and so cold, and we just stay there, stay there, stay there, we're missing out on another opportunity that God probably has for us, for someone who might have their heart and ears open and that spirit ready to receive Jesus Christ. It says that Paul goes away from this group, and he goes in to Tyrannus, and that's where he began to really preach. And it says that he was there two years Two years preaching the gospel, sharing the gospel, challenging men and women about who they are, where they can spend eternity, what they were going to do with their lives. So not only were these people accepting Christ during that time and him sharing the gospel, he was also discipling them and mentoring them so that they would be ready once Paul left there to get out on the battlefield. You see, there are a lot of men and women who are not only waiting to hear the gospel, they're waiting to see you live out the gospel so that they can see that what's in you that they desperately need it. And we desperately need to be the light for our lost friends and the lost people in our lives. And we miss it. Rejection should never be a reason to stop sharing the gospel. There are too many broken hearts, too many people that are in desperate need of something better And you and me who know Jesus Christ, we have what they're longing for. They just don't know it. But if we decide that we're going to stay in our little corner and we're going to feel comfortable, they're never going to hear the truth. Because this this is the truth of the matter. Paul goes to the synagogue. 
And maybe some of that reason is because he knows that's where the lost people are. He knows that's where the religious people are. So he hangs out exactly where they are. And really, in all honesty, most of us know where our lost friends are. Most of us know our lost family members. And it's a simple thing. Either we get out of ourself and get into Christ and tell them about Christ, or we lose them for an eternity. Paul carried that burden with him everywhere he went, every city that he stepped into. And all he could think about is that I'm going to be obedient to my father. Don't stop preaching the gospel. Don't become ashamed of the gospel. Just because there's some that won't receive and there's going to be some that reject and there's going to be some that run away from you. You reach who God has sent you to reach. You be obedient in that. Thirdly, and I close with this. He tells us, when the gospel is lived out in us, it can be contagious to our culture. When the gospel is lived out in us, it can be contagious to our culture. Look at verse 17. When this became known to the Jews and the Greeks living in, the Ephesus, in, in Ephesus, this is the deal. They realized that Jesus is the real thing. Because several verses up here ahead of it, it talks about Jesus' power and how he was affecting the whole community. It says that he was so enriched with God's love and his power that even his handkerchief and his apron were changing people's lives. And why was that? His handkerchief and his apron was something that he used all the time that he worked with. And God empowered that. It says that the handkerchief, they touched it and they were healed. I don't know about you. Let me tell you something. I know that some of us, when we hear that, maybe one of the first things we think of is Benny Hinn. Doesn't matter. I believe that there was moments in men's life and women's life when God was in, empowered them and had them, them doing great and mighty things, that there was moments like this to where that power was so strong in him that everything around him was empowered. So when they came to touch, they were healed. When he talked, they were healed. When they were open to truth, they were healed. This is the deal. When others around in this situation here, those who were trying to use evil spirits, well, the thing about evil spirits here is that all evil spirits know counterfeits also. So in other words, people who are out here doing ungodly things know if you're real or not. They can tell how you live your life if you're real or not. You see, wouldn't it be great that the spirits here said, huh, I don't know you. But Jesus and Paul, I know them, and I fear them. And why did they fear Paul? Because Paul was sharing a truth that was changing people's lives. You see, when, 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 when these people got real here, they came to their senses and understanding that Jesus is who he is. Jesus is the Messiah. What Paul preaches is real. It is true. And it says that they openly accepted it. It impacted their lives. It changed their life. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. They calculated the value of those scrolls. In other words, everything that these lost people thought were important to them, they were getting rid of it for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, maybe in our own lives, there are things that the Lord has said, get those things out of your heart and out of your life. Burn them. Let them go. They are hindrance to your walk. They're hindrance to what I want you to do. They're slowing you down. The gospel has to go forward, and it can't go forward in a dirty temple. It won't happen. He will not allow it to happen. Paul said, I preach the kingdom of God. 
I'm talking about letting the Lord be Lord of your life, being saved, being sanctified, and being on fire for the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just think, if we became contagious people, we have some sickness in our house, and if people have been sick, last week I was sick. Now everybody's sick. What would it be like for the first time being fired up about Christ and letting it be contagious? And that everywhere you went, people wanted what you had. And because you were living out truth and because you were doing it the right way and because you were honoring God and because you were praising him, they said, I want that. It would be so different. Church would be different. City would be different. State would be different. I believe in that. I truly believe in that. Paul had a burden for lost people. His heart was golden for the Lord. He was willing to even die if he had to, and he did. To share this news, his heart beat for Christ. Not for anything in this world, not to be popular, not to be accepted. He just wanted people to know Christ. Because in the end, men and women, that's all that's going to matter. All your possessions, all of our position, all of our popularity, all of our power, we're all going to have to bow. <laughs> we're all going to have to bow before a holy God. We're all going to have to humble ourselves before a holy God. Are you contagious? <laughs> because he needs us to be contagious. If we live this Christ thing out the way it's meant to be lived, we can change our environment. We can change our culture. We can change the hearts and the minds of young men and women. We could have revival. But it only takes place when we decide that we're not going to be ashamed of the gospel. We're not going to give up because people reject so-called us. <laughs> and we're going to start being contagious. Amen. We're going to start being contagious. That when we encounter people, they encounter Christ. Amen. Oh, I like that, and I just made that up. Thank you, Holy Spirit. That is powerful. <laughs> Let's take a hold of him the way he's taking a hold of us. And let's see what we can do in our society. Amen. Let's pray. Paul, if we could just live out some of your examples. If we could just be burdened for our lost people, for our lost friends, our lost family members. If our hearts daily would be mine for those who are living in darkness and lostness. I wonder, Lord, what, what would happen if we begin to get out of ourselves and got into you. The lives that would be impacted, the lives that would be changed, the hearts that would be softened, the ears that would be opened, the peace that people would experience, the joy that once they never knew, now that they can experience it because they know you. What would happen, Lord, if we died to self and denied self and picked up our cross daily? What would happen in our society? Paul wasn't waiting around to find out what, was happening, what would happen. He was making it happen through your power. He wasn't waiting on the sideline for somebody else to do it. He took on that responsibility as a believer, as a follower of Jesus Christ, that he was going to tell it, he was going to share it, he was going to preach it, and it was going to be boldly done, and he trusted you with the rest of it. Father, I pray for all of us that we will get excited about who you are, about what you've done in our lives, and that we would die to self 
and start picking up our cross every day and sharing the good news. Father, give us a burden for lostness. And those who may be out here this morning who, who may still not have a relationship with, the, with you, Lord, assure them that you want a relationship with them just the way that they are with all of their fears, doubts, sin, and everything else. And those of us who just want to walk the fence and just feel comfortable, relight our fire, Lord. Give us a hunger and thirst for your righteousness and give us a desire to speak truth in the lives of those we encounter. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did in Paul's life. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're going to do in our lives. Because once we have the information, we are accountable to you. I pray that we have a desire to do great things through you, Lord. We love you, and we give you praise this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.